<laughs> okay, and this is my gentle reminder to everybody that if you are not a presenter, if you can please go ahead and hit the mute button. Uh, don't worry, we'll have time later on where you all can um, either unmute and ask questions or pop your questions into the chat box and everything. But I just, um, uh, for now, if you could mute yourself, I would really, really appreciate it and everything. So welcome everyone to the March. It is March still. Uh, things have kind of been flying by for me. And this month's webinar is focusing on effectively telling your SCD story to key stakeholders. And um, I just wanted to share a little bit that I felt this was a relevant topic for folks. And I'll have some examples that hopefully will kind of help hit home why telling our story in an effective way is important. Um, so those of you that know me know that my background is in um, education and so I have a couple objectives that I just wanna share with everyone. So you kind of have an idea of what we'll be covering throughout this webinar and kind of what to expect. And so I'm hoping that by the end of today's webinar, uh, participants will be able to access resources to assist with districts sharing their story, be better able to build relationships with key stakeholders, and finally, making sure that we can communicate using language and an approach appropriate for those key stakeholders. So it's a lot of ground that we're gonna cover, but we have an awesome group of uh, panelists and resources that we were, we're gonna share um, to kind of help accomplish all these different goals. I'm going to briefly kind of get those housekeeping items out of the way just so that once we get to the panel, we can focus in on the panel because these are our experts and I wanna make sure that we give them our, give them as much time as they need. So this is the contact information for the soil and water leadership development team. Um, there's Jody, myself, Carissa as the administrative assistant and then Andrea Bowman and Jody runes also assist in various different ways and we're all here to support scds and the work that you're doing so always feel free to reach out to any of us um, if there's any ways that we can help support your districts so i'm just going to share a quick story that hopefully helps hit home the importance of effectively telling our story and i promise it'll it all makes sense. So the person that I'm, the picture I'm showing on the screen right now, um, his name is Ignaz Simonwise, and I probably butchered his last name. Um, phonics was never my strong suit growing up, but he is, an, uh, or was, I should say, a Hungarian physician who practiced in the mid 1800s. Long story short, through his experiences and observations, he discovered that physicians who washed their hands before performing operations resulted in dramatically lower death rates um, from childbed fever, which you know makes sense to all of us because we know how important washing our hands are. But back then, this was kind of a new phenomenon, right? And so um, while he had this data that significantly supported his germ theory, he was unable to effectively communicate the findings to the medical community. In fact, when he did publish his work, the medical community responded quite critically. And I think we can all see why his approach was rather ineffective, right? This is the graph that he shared with other medical um, professionals. And I don't know about you, but I can't really make a lot of sense of it. And his peers also had a hard time understanding the point that he was supposed or trying to get across to them, right? Especially when we compare it to this graph that is uh, much clearer and easier to comprehend. The two charts are sharing the same information, just using a different approach. And today I'm really hoping that this webinar will help us all better and more effectively tell the SCD story to key stakeholders because the work that all of you are doing is really important. And 
Um, I'm fortunate because part of my job is getting to attend meetings and attend events and just see all of the awesome work that you all are putting together. Um, and we have to make sure that we're sharing that story with our stakeholders um, throughout our county and across the state and everything. Um, now, um, I also mentioned that I wanted to share some different resources that we have available. I'm just going to take some time right now to quickly go over some of those resources, just because I want to make sure that we are not having to cut the panel off at an awkward point once the, we get the panel going, right? And so I just wanted to quickly show everyone that this is our Soil Conservation District resource page. Um, and we have all sorts of resources available to SCDs. Um, and the resources specifically that I wanted to point out, um, if Carissa could go ahead and copy the Google Drive into the chat box for everybody, I would appreciate it. And then I would encourage everyone, I like to star or bookmark these pages just so that they're a quick, easy reference for me. Um, but the file that I really want to focus on is if you go into the communication and outreach tab and then you click into legislative outreach, there are two different resources that are really helpful for SCDs and we'll hit home on them more later. Um, but there is a template for um, kind of sharing about the work that you do in an effective and to the point manner. And then as you can see, there's also some do's and don'ts that we share for SCDs when they're putting together these legislative updates or just sharing with folks, whether it's local or statewide. And then there's also um, this two pager and it talks about tips for engaging elected officials. And again, just two really good resources that I wanted to take time um, to share with all of you about. Um, so with that being um, said, I'm just gonna click over here and we'll go ahead now and jump into our panelist. Um, I'm just gonna introduce them quick and then we'll take time and have them share a little bit more about themselves. But we have um, Brandy Pyle, with the, she is the District 22 representative, um, Kayla Efforts Clevin, with Integrity Public Affairs, uh, Stanley Dick, he is a Cavalier County Commissioner, and last but certainly not least, we have Bob Flath, who's the uh, Lamore County Commissioner and the Ransom County SCD Watershed Coordinator. So I'm going to need to stop sharing, and I'll, to kind of start things off, I'll just have each uh, presenter, I'll call you out and you can just share a little bit more about yourself and um, just a little bit about your background, I would say. So, um, Kayla, do you want to start us off? I sure can. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Kayla Efforts Cleveland with Integrity Public Affairs in Bismarck. We are a contract lobbying firm where we do consulting and advocacy in the public affairs space. Um, oftentimes people love to tease us and say, oh, you only work four months every other year. Must be a cake job. Must be great. <laughs> well, I am the first to tell you that um, uh, if if you're going to do advocacy well, it definitely is not four months every other year when we are in legislative session. Um, in fact, we have a full team over at the state capitol today as we have IT interim committee meetings, taxation interim committee meetings. Um, there was a public comment education committee, a, a public comment uh, uh, virtual meeting that I just came off of with the Department of Public Instruction. Um, so we are uh, busy and getting busier as we have a changing landscape in North Dakota. Uh, my background is I spent uh, ju uh, just over seven years in Governor Hoven and Governor Dalrymple's office as a senior policy advisor, working in portfolio areas of tax, economic development, and agriculture and education primarily. And prior to that, I worked at the Department of Commerce. Um, 
It's a pleasure to be a lifelong North Dakotan. Live, grew up on a farm and ranch outside of uh, Minot and the in actually Velva, if that's familiar to most. And um, just really look forward to participating on today's panel. Awesome. Thanks, Kayla. Uh, Brandy, we'll have you go next. Ladies first. Oh, thank you. Um, yep, I'm State Representative Brandy Pyle. I live just outside of Castleton on a farm. Um, we grow soybeans, corn, and wheat um, and export our soybeans over to Asia. So we have four kids. I have a senior in high school this year. So we've been doing the crazy house projects um, that probably are unnecessary, um, but have been waiting to do that the kids are, are big enough um, before they launch. Uh, so I serve on appropriations. So I deal with uh, 24 out of the 49 budgets in my section. And before that, I was on um, the Education Policy Committee and the Political Subdivisions. So kind of my background, I'm a, a finance, I have a finance degree from the University of Minnesota. Awesome, thank you, Brandy. Stanley, we'll have you go next. Well, if you can all hear me, same thing, thumbs up. All right, thank you. Um, I'm a Cavalier County Commissioner. I farm with a brother and a son and a nephew. Uh, I became a commissioner nine years ago and one of my favorite portfolios has always been extension. And because I farm, obviously, that type of thing is very important to me. Uh, I also was the president of the North Dakota Association of Counties. I believe it was two years ago. And I've also been on a national association of counties. I served on the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Board and was in leadership there for two years. Uh, currently, I'm not on any of those. Uh, we just had a county commissioner's meeting in Bismarck last week. And we had a lot of commissioners there and it was attended very well, but uh, I'd like to say my full-time job is farming and commissioning is part-time, but I think my commission work takes up way more time than my farming. So <laughs> that's kind of the way it works, I think. I knew nothing about government. Well, I should say nothing, but very little about government prior to becoming a commissioner. I was, like I say, I farmed and I also coached high school basketball for 21 years. And I guess that coaching high school basketball kind of uh, prepared me to be a commissioner because some of the same skills you use as a coach, you use as a commissioner. So uh, I'm I'm honored to be part of this uh, group and I missed the pre one and I understand that, but I definitely wanna be a part in telling the story of soil conservation. Oh, and we really appreciate that, Stanley. Bob, I'll have you round off the group. Hey, my name is Bob Floth. I've been in the district, so conservation district world for 27 years coming up here next month. Um, been with the county commission in Lemoore County for approximately 20 years already. Uh, grew up on a farm by Garrison, North Dakota. Um, have an associate's degree in wildlife management and a bachelor's degree in zoology, all out of NDSU. That's me. Awesome. Well, and all of you came rec highly, highly recommended and everything. And so I think we're all very fortunate to have such a, uh, a knowledgeable panel. One housekeeping item is I do have a series of questions for this group that I'll be asking. But for those of you that are tuning in, please feel free to type in follow up questions that you might have in the chat box. Um, we really want to make sure that you, like, this is a webinar for SCD employees and supervisors and making sure that we get your questions answered. I think my questions are pretty good and everything like that, um, but I that's not to say that there aren't some other good ones out there. So with that being said, we'll kick it off with our first question. And I just really want to start off by having like hearing and sharing about, can you discuss the importance of grassroots advocacy. Why is it important that all SCDs come together and kind of show a, a united front in the effort to share the SCD story? Um, I know Bob had some good talking points with this. So maybe we'll start off with Bob and then um, everybody else can kind of chime in from there. 
Okay. I, I'll just throw in a couple, a couple little short little stories, I guess, a few years back, I was working with one of our, our representatives from the district here that I live in and in discussing things with him and the district with him, uh, he made a statement to me and it caught me off guard and said straight up right to my face, anyone can plant trees. Why do we need soil conservation districts? Um, yeah, totally caught me off guard and, and, and made a point of, of you know, knowing that I heard it and it, it, it's something we need to, to, to keep in mind that there are folks out there that are asking those kind of questions. Um, in the same breath, you know, the, you can look at, there's an OHF grant out there right now. I don't, I'm not sure if it's active anymore or not. It was with the North Dakota Petroleum uh, Council or group. Um, had an OHF grant where they were planting trees and had a private contractor traveling all across the state planting trees. So proof positive, um, districts aren't the only ones that can plant trees. And, and, and having it as one of our major major incomes and, and support <laughs> support of our support structure, it's kind of important to us, but that, that mindset is out there. Um, the other thing in the last few years that's really shined through was the, the grass seed sales debacle we had a few years back where we had some, some private grass seed folks that were calling us out and wondering why we should be selling grass seed when we're, we're taking mill levy money and, and interrupting or disturbing their private business that they're trying to make a living at. So there, there are issues out there that we need to deal with and get, get and make sure the public knows and our grassroots people know about why we do it and how, how we can do it. Do you have any ideas of how uh, you shared some of those challenges? What are some ways that um, you've kind of helped communicate the work that you're doing? Um, you know, just talking to these folks and, and making sure they know, um, you know, the, the statutes and, and, and what gives us the right to be there and to do what we're doing and, and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, yeah, it's just word of mouth and, you know, I think that's the important part. You know, I'm not the greatest at, at some of these things. And that's why I, I turn to our group. You know, maybe there there is someone, there's a Hannah that can get it across, the point across better than I can. And that's that's why we need to, to band together and work together. And some of us are better at some things than others. Um, we should We should learn to take advantage of that and help each other out. Yeah, I think those I think are that, some good points. Brandy, you want to chime in? Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I think Bob hit on a key point that, um, you know, not everybody has the same skill set that working together in collaboration um, builds a successful team. And um, doing everything on your own um, is a lot of work. Um, and there's no I in team. And especially when uh, this is helpful. And, and examples that I have seen at the state level, the SBEAR, higher education, um, all the chambers, the major four came together for base retention this year that they came in and lobbied for. Um, and I know that they could have dropped Fargo or Bismarck um, and just given the money to Minot and Grand Forks where the bigger bases are, um, but all four stuck together. And, and even though Fargo and Bismarck didn't get as much, those two, the two missions that those two serve are just as important as what Grand Forks and Minot serve. And so everybody got a little bit of something. Of course, Minot and Grand Forks deservedly uh, got more, but we were able to advocate for everybody. Um, and in my opinion, it was it was fair uh, for what uh, the impacts to those communities. Um, so it's just, it's getting to know your neighbor um, and how to advocate uh, across the state for that. And then when you come to the, to the state level, um, a united front always works better. Um, and advocating for us so we don't have to run around and meet, you know, 40 different people versus just a couple and, and having the same message helps. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about teamwork. I'm kind of curious too, as far as especially the grassroots aspect of it. And, um, you know, sometimes I think, oh, it's uh, 
the Kaylas of the world, their job to advocate for SCDs? What are the benefits for, and I think I would welcome like Brandy or Stanley specifically, like the, your local constituents, kind of those grassroots folks and um, having a good uh, relationship with those local folks. And does that influence or impact your decisions as a local or statewide leader? Uh, I'll chime in if you don't mind. Um, just a little bit going back to what Bob said, I think there's a real under misunderstanding what soil conservation does compared to a national scene on green energy and all those type of things. Um, so I think it's very important that we have a united front on this and that when we talk about soil conservation and grass and tree planting and stuff, it has nothing to do with electric cars and you know any of those type of environmental things as a whole. It's it's environmental and it's conservation, but it's not. We're not into the national scene. We're doing stuff locally, and so one of the things that we do and what we really promote is we have a winner every every uh, year in. Uh, Cavalier County, the winner of our soil conservation. And that big 11 by 14 picture, whatever, it goes right in the hallway of our FSA offices. And so people can see every year some of the direct benefits of planting trees and grass and, you know, just making farmsteads not only uh, better and how it's all planned out, which soil conservation helps do, do with the trees, but just an environment that's uh, conducive to uh making the whole county the whole community look better as well as the benefits you know that go along with the trees and the grass and everything around the farmstead mm -hmm. and i'll add to that yes i think the grass roots is important um we are lucky in my district that the three of us um our senator and the two representatives get along um so generally we each kind of take a a different subject um, so Senator Weber would probably be our contact person in our district for something like this. Um, and he would be the one to go out to coffee. Um, we drink a lot of coffee um, or breakfasts and lunches, um, all kinds of stuff. He'll he'll go and check fields and stuff. So we'll just go out for for drives in the in and check fields um, just to have that conversation and that connection. I think um, having those connections are really important. Um, and so then when we have to have those harder conversations, when we're talking about money, when we're talking about, you know, the effectiveness and the ROI, um, A, when we're limited on, on funds, you know, those are harder conversations to have that you have that base foundation and that, that understanding that uh, having those harder conversations is a little bit easier and it's not taken quite so personally. Um, it's still a hard conversation to have, but, um. If you can find one person in your in your legislative team or your county team, that works great. If you don't get along with one, there's other ones that you can find. Um, there's a lot of us that you can can reach out to. A lot of them have a, a farming background and understand the importance of soil conservation. Um, and then there's a lot of them in Fargo and West Fargo that don't have that background that do need a little bit of that education. I think I might just add just a little bit of a lot of a, a very common mis, misperception is that okay well we'll hire we'll hire a Kayla and we'll just you know get we'll we'll let it sit and we'll just expect it to be done and well Kayla will be out front and and we'll be behind her no that's not the best or the way that we will even take a client quite frankly um, is that we're actually behind you pushing you to the right committee, to the right champion, finding the right way to simplify your message and make sure that it's consistent. Uh, because I'll tell you, the gra the organizations that have a grassroots like what you do, where there's a presence in every county, they're my favorite. They're my absolute favorite because there's a contact across the whole state and and you can activate quickly and and when when things go south as far as the message if there's confusion or whatever it may be you can clarify it and then you can push out the right message the key is that you're all singing from the same song sheet that you've got your home base message you've got your first base your second base your third base and your home run 
right? That's always what I love to coach organizations on. What is it? Let's play some baseball here, right? Um, what is what is home base? What is the objective of what we're doing? Are we playing defense? Or are we going on offense? Um, and, and being ready with those connections, because if we wait until January to, to figure out who we need to go to, too late. It's too late. Thank you. It's too, too late. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's, it's just going to get tougher out there. So doing the hard work now, the good news it's March. It's great news. There's a lot of time to be able to figure out, okay, who are my people? Who are the people that might be replacing my people? Okay. And then, uh, and then how does that look for us? And, and especially with, you know, the topic of property tax being such a hot button issue. So uh, just a little bit on the, the double edged sword of the grass roots uh, that can can be out there. Yeah, I think those are all some really good points to bring up. And I want to circle back to Brandy's point about, you know, she mentioned driving around and creating those baseline relationships and everything. And I think Kayla, you also touched on like the importance of those local relationships too. What are some other strategies to help build and maintain positive relationships with key stakeholders? Any suggestions for SCD personnel? Um, for us, don't assume, you know, that, you know, the same. Uh, that goes with that. Um, there's always new information out there. Um, there's so many different backgrounds and uh, viewpoints that, you know, education is good. Um, just having a, a conversation and getting to know the people. Um, I know we get teased a little bit and probably Kayla too, that, you know, that we're going to vote the way Kayla tells us to. And we have all these like, you know, they, they dictate everything that we do and we have great relationships with the lobbyists, but we want the relationships with our constituents and the groups. Um, that's who we work for. That's who elect us. Um, and the information that Kayla helps us with to decide, it comes from you. I do not have any staff. Um, if I unblurred my background, you would see that I decorate with paperwork all over my office. Um, I have senior paperwork and I have you know, I, I chair a, a legislative committee, so I, I do read stuff off my computer, but then I also print stuff. Um, but this is my office and, um, yeah, I just, it's a, it's a lot of extra work that people I don't think really truly understand. So just being, just having attitude of gratitude, I know that's kind of redundant, um, but just taking it slow and, and, you know, hopefully the, the legislator will too, um, but everybody is busy and knowing that um, it'll be okay. I know in our county when uh, our local uh, SCD board presents their budget to us, what we've done in the last couple of years is we've made them go line by line and show how the money, money is being spent and, and the, the good things that have done been done with that funds you know, because they are limited to a certain amount of funds, but I think there's such, and again, it's an education thing. There's such a lack of education on what, you know, what SCD does. And so therefore, just to educate not only myself, but the rest of the commission and, and in essence, you know, we have people there, the media there and, and other people there at our meetings, and then they can pick up on it too. And, and you know, things get printed in the local newspaper and things like that. Uh, education but part of that education for us is just having our local stds line by line why are we spending money here why are we spending money there and and with that what's the benefit of spending that money there what's the benefit of spending the money there i mean are you just spending money because you have that money to spend or what's and and it's no different than i believe in any other county they're always looking for as much money as they can because they're always short staffed and they don't have enough people and and they're trying to do the good work that they'd be designed and what it's set up to do. But sometimes as commissions, we question the dollars being spent. And when they can show us through education exactly where that's going, man, that's a game changer. There was absolutely, the last couple of years, there's been really not a whole lot of even discussion. It's like, yeah, you need that money. Uh, this is what it's for. And go, go get them, people. Go get them. 
Well, and I just want to jump in and add to that, that it's, um, it's nice. It sounds like your SCD is going the extra mile to be transparent and walk through that budget. And I think it's important for SCDs to um, like recognize that, um, you know, they are able to secure so much mill levy to, to 2.5 mills and everything, um, but that it helps that relationship by being willing to take a step back and go through that budget with the local county commissioners and um, to build that relationship and to educate folks and just take that extra time and go the extra mile um, to do that. I think that's um, it's so important that I'm glad you, you brought that up because um, an SCD, um, if the county commissioners have extra questions, sometimes it can be um, easy to take offense. Like, what? What do you? Why do you? Why are you asking questions? Like, we're good stewards of this money, and um, to just understand it from that perspective and how you brought it up, I appreciate it, um, Stanley. Bob, how how have you guys worked to make relationships, both from? It'll be interesting hearing from you since you're an employee and a county commissioner. I think you can see it from both perspectives pretty well. Yeah, I like I like Stanley's comment with the budget, you know, going through the budget. Um, I'd even go a step further uh, in that I've, I've worked with, you know, it, it's kind of limitless. It's amazing when you start hearing about all the different boards that are out there and who you can visit with or sit down with and, and just get on an agenda and go to a meeting, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to be budget time. Maybe you've got something big going on that, that someone would be interested in, you know, your city council, your township board, your, your county commission, you got water resource boards, you got weed boards, you got emergency planning committees. You've got, I mean, I mean, so many boards that are doing so many different things. I mean, I mean you start looking at, at what they can and can't get involved in and, and all of a sudden, you know, your, your stream bank project or, or something is, you know, they should be involved. You find out, well, you know, you, the, certain people like a water resource board has uh, levying capabilities. They can levy taxes in the county, you know, to a certain extent. And maybe it's something they'd be interested in being involved with. And, and they're, your, they're also your avenue to the state water commission or the Department of Water Resources now, you know, and, and possible more funding there. And, and just working the avenues and, and having, like Stanley said, the, the, the press is at most of these meetings and not all of them by any means, but every once in a while you get some free advertising out of the deal. You know, they start hearing, oh, you're, you know, you're doing this too? Why, you know, why are you involved in that? And it brings on questions and, and just gets it out to the public. So yeah, there's, there's lots of avenues to work and, and lots of small little meetings going on that not a lot of people know about. They all help. You know, we talked a little bit about finances. Do you adapt your strategy in response to your situations? And what I mean by situations is maybe, maybe changing financial situations or varying audiences. Um, does that affect how you go about building these relationships for any of you? I love the advice that was given to me when I start, first went into business. Um, the best time to talk to your banker is when you don't need money. And so stopping in and visiting my banker to tell them about how things are going and things are, you know, is always time really well spent. Um, and I think a lot of the same applies with legislators. Letting them know honestly about what's going on when there isn't an ask and, and whether that be successes or trials, um, telling your story doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be manufactured and coordinated. You just have to do it. And so I think that's one of the things, no matter who's in office or, or what the trend is, what the topic is, tell your story and do it in an honest and genuine way. I think too approaching these, you know, the, all of these boards. If you are going to approach these boards, do a little homework, 
or even if you're going to visit with a with a state representative or someone, you know, do a little homework and a little research on what what they're advocating or what did they do at their last three meetings. You know, the, the, a lot of these minutes are available online. Go in and do a little reading. I mean, it, it'll it, some of it'll stick with you, and and you take it with you, and you can talk the talk a little bit. It really impresses them when you can, you know, throw throw a little something in there that they didn't think you would ever know anything about. And, <laughs> It just puts you on a different page, I think. Yep. And being the legislator, you know, um, short and sweet is always good. And I think Kayla's the hit the nail on the head too is, you know, be honest. Don't inflate the numbers, don't deflate it. Just just be truthful. Um, I think those are something that we can always discuss. Um, you know, emotions get into things and and that's hard to take out of some of the conversations because we're very passionate about what we do. Um, in all areas, whether it's education, soil conservation, you know, n name it, uh, we have people who are very, very passionate. Um, and, and that's wonderful. And that's how our state was forged. We were pioneers in everything. Um, so, you know, tell your story and, and be truthful. And then, you know, I always say do a little self-reflection too. And, uh, um, I don't know. I always practice my ums too. I'm struggling with that at the moment, but it's a good You're one. Good. You're good. I was <laughs> going to add uh, this. Is, so we're talking about how do you effectively tell your story, right? And part of the reason I shared that story at the beginning was just the importance of communicating using the language of the people that you want to connect with and my follow-up question for all of you is, you know, you're saying keep it short and sweet. Like, how do you like to receive that information? What are some, some tips and tricks there? How do I like to receive the information is one-on-one -on -one and in person, not by a text or an email. Uh, and I know that's probably old school and I'm probably older than most of you that are on yours, but that to me is still the biggest thing. And, and and be totally honest in our age of technology, even what we're doing right now, I like it. We have an opportunity to do something that we couldn't do. Otherwise we'd have to travel, but the yeah. best communication is still one-on-one -on -one, face to face, genuine, you know, shake the hands or whatever, or have a lunch together. Um, and I found that being on the, state association and national association and sometimes it's best even meeting them for me personally i've done this many times meeting the stakeholder after the meeting just one-on-one -on -one and saying you know i just heard what you said and i loved it or i didn't like this or didn't like that to me personally i think the most influence i've ever had with with people that you know i want to deal with is technically right after the meeting because sometimes the people that talk in the meeting talk for the sake of being seen or heard and they you know it's it's one of those things that yeah I got I got to say my say in the meeting but most of the time I found and I it goes to state level it goes to local level it goes to national level when you can talk to them one-on-one -on -one afterwards you find out what they really think and really believe because sometimes they're very careful now they burst their words in a meeting because they don't want that sound bite on the news or something that they didn't mean to say or they did say and didn't really mean it that way and you know, it's just the world we live in nowadays. They can take anything out of context or do anything and change it a little bit. It might be your words, but it might not be really what they mean. So for me personally, it's just meeting with these people, stakeholders, one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, -face in a genuine way. Well, I'm glad you bring that up because I'm not going to quote this research or these facts totally correct but they do say that there is so much that's communicated just by through your body language when you're in person and um and it's the vast majority when you're communicating with people is that body language and you could be saying the most perfect eloquent thing but if you've got a scowl on your face and your hands are folded over and you don't look very approachable they're not going to hear the words that you're saying they're going to be seeing how you're acting and that can rub them wrong or when you send an email or a text message um, that person uh, <laughs> even if they know you really well 
they're not going to read that in your voice. That's They're going to read it in their voice. And maybe they're having a bad day and they have a flat tire and they're stressed out and they're just um, misinterpreting what you're saying. So I think you're right, Stanley. And I, I will say, I think I'm significantly younger than you, but I also appreciate those in-person, one-on-ones. I think that's, regardless of the generation, um, that's really important to a lot of folks. Uh, I'll stop talking though. This is for the time for the panelists. Does anybody else want to chime in? I'm a Stanley there too. I think they, they've always said around around the, the county commission here in Lemoore County is that you know the majority of the business got done at the cafe after the meeting was over. Or, or nowadays it's maybe after you 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 quit recording your meeting and adjourn and and a couple of you stick behind and you know things get accomplished better. Um, it's it's the one on one thing, like Stanley said, for sure. I would agree with Stanley and Bob. It's definitely one on one. Um, it's def it's old school. It's it's so important to read body language. It's important. There's so much you learn in just having a simple conversation. The silly stories that come up um, when you're having a cup of coffee. I mean, I this I had an interview the other day, and I am the worst texter. Um, I can even write it out correctly and autocorrect just switches it to something else. And my friends are just, they're always harassing me, which is totally fine. I deserve it. I don't proofread anything before I send it in texting. Um, but that, like, like Hannah said, it's something completely different. The message is wrong instead of what I'm trying to say. Um, but in the world during COVID, it was cold and it was lonely um, and people were struggled. And so humans are created for connection. And I think we have to remember that part of our society. And, um, and that interaction is, is vital to our mental health. Um, and mental health is important to have success on, on all the boards that we serve on, um, regardless of what they are. So that's my opinion. And if you ever get a text from me, uh, sorry. It, it will say some pretty weird stuff every day. I, it, it, yeah, I won't even say, but it, it's every day. It, it, it happens. Representative Miles can probably speak to when this happens too, of kind of some of the do's and don'ts when, when, when votes come to the floor and that personal connection is going to make a lot why you're going to open that email maybe a little bit quicker because a lot of times what people will have is a form email and that form email okay. gets sent out to oh you know oh. The groups, right and it's a copy paste yeah. and send and last i heard those aren't so effective <laughs> no no we prefer and I, this is something i've said for eight years if you can do a personal story it doesn't have to be very long if you're not a great storyteller or a great emailer, that's totally fine. Just do your best. Um, but those form emails, if that's all you have, that's okay. I mean, if, if that's the minimum you have and that's the only time you have, that's fine. Um, but I can tell you for one vote, we had over 400 emails and it was the same email just with different names. And so it totally clogs up the emails when you're trying to find the other emails for the other 900 votes that we're trying to take. So when we're trying to get the work done, that, that's not effective for what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do for the, the constituents that I serve. Um, and Kayla is exactly right. Um, and if I see your name and I know you're a constituent of mine, I absolutely respond. If I know you're not, if I know you and you're across the state, I'll respond. Um, but I don't have time to respond to everybody. Um, so if you know your legislator, that's the best way to do it. My and again, that's my opinion, but that's how I advise people when you're when you're reaching out to, to the people. But if you if you know me, um, or, or say, hey, I was you know met you on on a panel and I liked what you said, or I didn't like what you said, or I think you should do this. Um, I'm always you know I'll take the constructive criticism. I'm not a perfect person, um, but you know always make reference to where you know that person. To that helps. Um, 
that's kind of how I do it too. When I send my letters off to people that I have to write to, too, I'm like, okay, so here's what I think you need to do a little bit better. Or here's what I, you know, where I met you and hopefully you remember me type of thing. So. I want to, so at the beginning of the webinar, we shared a couple of resources about how to create legislative updates, which can be shared with county commissioners or your representatives and everything. Is that, I know we're saying get them in person, make that personal connection. That's really important. But we all also leave like really busy lives. Like what can we do to maintain those relationships? Like doing these legislative or county commissioner updates, is that worth our time and your time? Or how do we maintain those relationships? I like a one sheeter. Um, if I get one from NDSU Extension, I read that one. It's a one sheeter of the different programs they do. It's a couple of sentences and the different things. I always read those. Um, and then when I see her in public, she knows me. I know her. And I probably see them maybe once, maybe twice a year. Um, and again, I've been a legislator for eight years, but I know who they are. And um, the really cool thing is, is I... And one to hound people of like, um, I like the um, the tours. So um, Cass County is finally coming out, the, our commission, and they're bringing all the heads of the departments out to Castleton, out to Page, uh, to meet our rural constituents. And so um, now we're hoping to get people there, but we'll visit with all of our, our constituents so that they can see their locally elected officials here um, soil conservation, um, veteran service op officer. Um, but that is important um, because I get the complaints that, you know, our county people aren't out here. Well, we finally got them out here. And um, so hopefully we can help foster those connections. So again, coffee will be served and cookies. You know, one really easy thing to do that oftentimes gets missed and it, it, it's so funny how many times I get after folks when it when they miss it is when you have events when you have local local events invite your legislators just because they don't come doesn't mean they don't care because but just just making sure that they know and then if they do come uh, please do recognize them when they're in the room and and maybe maybe you don't remember their names, but maybe just asking any legislators who would be here elected officials, please do stand. Um, thank you for being here um, because that's a win win. I mean, always I always love approaching, um, you know, objectives for like who else can win from this who else would really appreciate that the legislators in the room we just heard it from representative Powell. she's looking to connect with constituents so but if constituents in the room don't know that she's in the room we're not making connections and so the more way we can act as a facilitator um the better the win-win is Family, I'm seeing some head nodding from you. Is what Kayla and Brandy are hitting home, does that apply to our local folks too? Or is this just for our statewide legislators? Or I, I, actually, I actually think that's a great idea that Kayla just brought, the, brought about. I mean, I know when we have legislators at different meetings, it's kind of important to them, to them the, for them to even know that, you know, I took the time and effort even though maybe I was invited or they wanted me here, but I took the time and effort to come and listen. And so if you recognize them, you obviously are gonna have a lot more influence when it comes time to you know, vote on a certain situation or to discuss a certain situation. And even for us, you know, when, I, when I was on the state and the National Association of Counties, when I went to these different meetings and I, I really concentrated on the agricultural stuff just because of my background, but when you could be recognized, it makes you feel like, yeah, what you're doing is important. And that that's human beings. We have to have a sense of worth. And so it, it, if our legislators or even myself, when I was at these different meetings and no one seemed to care whether you were there or not, guess what? You probably didn't care either. I mean, you really don't. If no one cares that you're there and you really didn't want to be there and no one cares you know, for your opinion or anything, it's like, yeah, you probably won't spend a whole lot of time in that 
topic or that issue. So I, that's that's great advice, and and I think that's that's advice for local to state. To, even when I'm on the national association, that you know, just to make sure you recognize some of the leaders outside of yourself and outside of the the norm. That it's like, yeah, it's important you're here. Thank you for being here. And this is this is possibly our story or issue. Yeah, and it's not for our egos. We don't get paid for any of that. Um, I mean, a lot of our work is volunteer, so. Um, a lot, you know, if I travel to Fargo, it's 40 mile round trip for me. Um, so I'm paying for my own gas and volunteering my time um, to go to extension meetings or other meetings that are held in Fargo. So when people come out to my community, um, I always make a point and super appreciative that I don't have to travel. So and that's I mean, that that's a blessing to me. I don't mind going to Fargo, but it generally cost me a trip to a store too. I mean, you got to go shopping somewhere. You can't, you got to make it cost effective to do your errands. I thought that's only, I was just telling somebody how when I go places in Southwest North Dakota, I'm doing work and I'm buying groceries and I'm picking up dog food and all the things. Um, Bob, do you have anything to add? Or I, I have a question locked and loaded for you if you're ready. <laughs> I'll just, I guess, reiterate too the our 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 corner of the state, the southeast region. Of, there's five counties. We have a, an association made up of five, our five county association where we get together. We should be, you know, quarterly, but it it typically doesn't happen that way. And then we do always invite all of our reps from from the districts involved in the, those five counties. And, and we'll even ask them to, to you know, give us an update. And, and, and a lot of times we do have these meetings in and around session and when session's going on and try to try to work with their calendar because they want to get the word out to the public too. So we'll invite them to give us a rundown. And uh, you put 20, 30 or more, you know, county commissioners and county employees, auditors and, and and you know anyone that works for the county counties are invited and and like I say we'll get thirty you know at a typical meeting and that gives them a pretty good audience to to approach I mean that that's your grassroots right there in getting it back to the communities and and to the the people in the communities so yep I like it yeah well and I want to. I think we should do the same thing with our area meetings, with our SCD area meetings. I'm, I'm not sure that we do, but you know, maybe we should be making that invite or throwing those invites out to our our representatives and senators for sure. Welcoming them into the fold, and they at least got the invitation, regardless if they choose to show up or not. Yep. So one. The thing that as I've been visiting with Bob leading up to this webinar and circling back a little bit to the um, being creative, forming partnerships, and then how you can help uh, by partnering with others, it can help you accomplish the conservation mission and accomplish different projects, especially when um, finances are a struggle as they are for a lot of SCDs. And Bob, you had a really great example of how in your county, you've gotten to work with um, different, we'll say groups to get conservation on the ground. Could you share a little bit more and go into more detail about what that looks like? Yeah, I did. After we talked about that, did a little more digging and homework and just, I, I mean, I, I remember the bigger projects, you know, which I mean, are some of them are extremely large. Um, you just we we overlook a lot of what what is soil conservation and what are we trying to do? We're trying to stop the dirt from blowing and we're planting trees. Um, you know, a lot of times we overlook a, a stream bank project where the stream is sloughing and, and you're adding tons and tons of sediment into the water system. And you know, if there's a way to stop that or or a dam, um, working with a group, some groups right now in in trying to repair a dam that's that structurally dysfunctional and and is contributing sediment into the river system right now um but yeah I've, I've, I've worked on a major dam repair in the past and then also some stream bank 
projects where, I mean, you start bringing into play, you know, your local lake associations, your, your water resource boards are huge because they're your conduit to the Department of Water Resources in the state of North Dakota and engineering services. And we have some of our own engineering services through the 319 program. I manage the what's called the BMP team for the for the active 319 projects in the state and you know Department of Health or not the Department of Health anymore, but um, I mean I've worked with the North Dakota National Guard, the Army Corps of Engineers, the you know North Dakota Emergency Response, EPA, the Governor's Office. I mean I you know I, I've been through a lot of it and and funneled money through so many different routes, you know, and done done some really major projects that that accomplish things, but you got to know where to go, who to, who to talk to, you know, how to talk to them. Um, there, there's money, there's, there's funding available for a lot of these projects. And, and some of them are, like I say, fairly huge. Um, working on a million dollar little project right now on a stream bank um, repair. And, you know, you're, you're working with the feds, you know, NRCS and emergency funds and, there's just a lot of different ways to go and you don't you don't think of that as being a soil conservation district project you know i've got a couple of these projects where i mean the, the current one i'm working on now has been worked on a couple other times i mean i've got three three inch ring binder three ring binders that are full of permits and applications and funding you know contracts and it, it piles up and it, it's a job in itself but someone's got to pay some wages too i'm not i guess i can volunteer somewhat and i do <laughs> but you know that, that that's where a lot of districts fall short i think is you know you, you've got districts out there that have a single employee and they're they're you know either not levying as much as they should or they don't want to levy at all or they're you know they're they're living on their tree planting money and and you've got one person doing it all everything and it, it it's it can be a struggle there's no doubt I mean it and I mean my days are full being a commissioner and and also working a full time job with the soil conservation district I'm, I'm jam packed but. I you still try and push through and get it done. It, it's you know to take that picture in the end and or to to be standing on a dam with you know uh, Mr. Sprintson attic and having a picture taken on a project that you accomplished. It it can put a little feather in your hat, make you feel good at the end of the day, and and then they even give you a ride in their helicopter or you know make it really awesome. But so yeah, I've been involved in some bigger stuff, and then there's ways to do it. I mean, there, there's money out there. You just, you, you have to see it and work with the right people and make it happen. Not trying to put a feather in my hat and just saying I, I tried to do the job and, and make things happen. I think it's actually another common misperception too, is that we think that we're bragging about ourselves and we're trying to make ourselves look good when really the taxpayers are expecting their dollars to be spent wisely. And so you returning the information back to not only legislators or, or any elected official, but your, your constituents of here's how the money was spent, AKA, um, here's what I did. Here's what I worked on. Here's the status of it. Here's the challenges. Here's, you know, here's the honest wins. Um, and it may not, and it doesn't always have to be the big stuff, but you know, you know, re, that we often just say return on investment. We got to say return on investment. What is it? Well, what is return on investment? Return on investment is what did we do? What, it, what impact did it make? And, and being able to, to quickly and easily communicate that it is, um, is a big win for everybody. Well, I'm. Oh, Stanley, do you have one? Well, I'd like to share something. You know, like I said, I was on the National Association of Counties, and there's a, a urban misconception. You know, we're, we talk about carbon and carbon dioxide and all that stuff, and, and I'll just use trees. Some of the meetings I've been on, on a National Association of County meeting, you know, I'm on agricultural affairs, is that there's such a misconception. I, and I share the story that we, you know, 
we're the prairies and all you guys do is grow grass and it should be the buffalo commons and all that stuff and i said we we also plant trees trees take in carbon carbon dioxide it's just it's just the way biology works and therefore we're not out here to destroy the world and destroy the planet just because we want to make a buck and and that's a that's a crazy story you have to tell you think because the bottom line is there's so many people that in legislatures and not only on the you know there's some on the state level but on a national level that they don't understand that we are the most conservationist group of people there are that is farmers we want the land and we want the soils to stay here for not only my generation but the next generation and and the misconception is that nobody knows how to do it and i keep reminding them we have land grant universities and we have local opportunities to to show how us show us how to do it we don't need a a national mandate that says you have to do it one way or another. I says, we're already doing it in, in, a, in a lot of different ways. And so I think it's a story that's hard to tell and it's a story that's misconceived or it's it's not understood very well. And I'm talking more on a national level now because I think North Dakota gets it pretty well. But if we give up something like soil conservation, that's a story I can't tell anymore on a national level that we are doing things, you know, and again, I'm talking trees. Trees are important here for the wind and the soil and to keep things in place. And we don't want everything to blow away like in the thirties. So we have created this organization and it is taxpayer dollars, but generally, at least in our County, and I, I won't speak for any other County, but generally we don't have a, a big fight about those dollars being spent within our counties to do the very things that, on a national scale, they're telling us we're not doing. It's like, no, we're doing some of this already. And it's a positive, it's a positive impact on our counties and on our in our part of the, the world. Yeah. And I think this is the great I we're at the bottom of the hour and everything. And so I just want to pause everyone and say thank you so much for your time. And I think kind of what we're ending on is so important that it's important for you to share your story and SCD employees and supervisors they're so humble and they have a hard time um, tooting their own horn and it's not hard for me again to brag about all the great work that everybody is doing because they are doing great work Um, but we all need to do our part to to share that message and connect with our local constituents or our local stakeholders and to just get that word out um, because it can't just be the Hannah's or the Kayla's. It has to be everyone working together to get that message across. And so thank you again to all of our panelists and thanks to our listeners for tuning in. I'll be sending out this recording later. And then there wasn't a lot of questions or any questions in the chat, I should say, but if the panelists are comfortable with it those that want to share their contact information if anybody wants to reach out directly i'll share that also once we get this webinar um uploaded and everything and i'll include those extra resources that i went over as well so um, thank you again so much everybody and you all have a great rest of your day thank you thanks hannah